Good morning, everybody. This is Chris Hislop from the Montana World Affairs Council. Welcome to another session of Connect Montana. Very pleased this week to have some friends and guests on uh, as this is the United Nations Week. We're gonna be taking a closer look at some key issues um, within um, and relating to the United Nations. The um, Connect Montana will essentially have our guest speaker speaking for 10 or 15 minutes. Then we will be taking uh, questions and answers from participants. I've muted all of your microphones, um, and so it will only be uh, Charles and myself on audio, but please use the chat function to send me any questions you might have. Now let me introduce Charles Petrie. Uh, he has close to 30 years experience working in contexts of conflict and famine, much of it with the UN system. He resigned from the UN at the end of 2010 as the Secretary General's representative to Burundi. Since leaving the UN, he has undertaken various policy advisory functions, for example, to the President of Somalia and the Syrian opposition, and coordinated a response to the Myanmar peace process. In March 2012, Charles Petrie led an internal review of the UN's failure in Sri Lanka. Thank you for joining us, Charles. Over to you. Thanks, Chris. I, I hope you and the others won't mind that uh, I've actually prepared a bit of a text to make sure that I can share as much as uh, I'm able to over that 10 to 15 minute period. So, so I'll start. You know, it is, and of course, the, the, the subject matter is, is the UN United Nations worth saving? I think I need to start off by explaining why I may appear to be so harsh towards an organization I served for more than 20 years and whose principles and values I not only fully respect, but remain totally committed to. I am tough on the UN because I believe in it. After more than 30 years, for more than 30 years, I've witnessed the horrors of war, violence, and famine but I've also seen the consequences of the UN's refusal to learn lessons from its failures. Today, I cannot, accept that the U I cannot accept the UN's slow, apparently inevitable slide into irrelevance. The world can't afford it. Simply put, the UN has to wake up. The world is in the midst of a fundamental mutation. The fight to contain the spread of the virus has already been deeply disruptive, but much more is to come. The lockdowns will have profoundly altered economic life. The dramatic commitments already made by governments to offset the impact of the measures will need to be delivered. And as a result, governments will have to radically refocus their budgets. Forced to stay in their homes, people are suffering. Many don't even know if they will have jobs to return to. And those with children must struggle to find ways to occupy them in the confined spaces of their apartments. Sadly, domestic violence is on the rise. It is to be feared that when the restrictions have been lifted, social tensions and disconnect will inevitably find expression in the streets, with anger growing as the inequities of the rollout of the economic packages become more apparent. We are confronting a major global challenge. And this is occurring just at a time when multilateralism or an acceptance of collective thought and action has been severely weakened by the emergence of a type of Darwinian world order. A world order where the strong either ignore the needs of others or even attempt to impose their will on all others. In today's world, those national, international institutions with the command over financial resources have a critical role to play. But those institutions whose legitimacy is to be found in values and principles, such as the UN, are finding it increasingly difficult to be relevant. Bit of background. During the Cold War period, the UN served a purpose. It was a platform on which the two superpowers, the US and the Soviet Union, jousted. And as a result, many conflicts were averted and international tensions eased. But today, there is no more jousting on the security, UN Security Council. The institution is increasingly paralyzed as any one of the permanent five members, an outdated construction that needs to be changed, is able to use its veto to block any collective action. And to think that only three decades ago, there was so much hope. The Cold War had ended, and with it came the possibility of a new world order based on the respect of universal principles, 
and the application of the rule of law. In those first couple of years of the 1990s, it really seemed as if the intent of the authors of the UN Charter finally had a chance of being realized, that the international community would finally be united to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, reaffirm faith in the fundamental human rights, to establish conditions of justice and respect for international law, and to promote social progress and better standards of life in larger freedom. But this basically Western-led possibility was short-lived. In my view, it was the body of a Black Hawk helicopter pilot drawn through the streets of Mogadishu on October 3, 1993, that broke the back of any international will to engage in a principled operation. The US-led Operation Restore Hope was basically the first and the last international attempt at a noble enterprise to end the famine and disarm the warlords. Following the debacle of Somalia, the most influential members of the international community decided to not only to only intervene when their national interests were at stake. And initially there were no national interests at stake that justified any intervention in Rwanda. 26 years ago today, the genocide against the Tutsis started. Over a period of 100 days, between 850,000 and a million people were murdered. It took hundreds of thousands of people to be killed before the Security Council even started to seriously consider overcoming its reticence and beginning engaging in Rwanda. By the time the international community deployed, everyone was already dead. Many talk about Rwanda as being the seminal moment that shook the international community into action. But what action? How did the lessons from Rwanda protect the Tamil civilian populations who were obliterated under indiscriminate shelling in the Vani pocket of Sri Lanka in 2009? Or where, or where were the lessons to come in aid of the Rohingya oppressed, abused, and subsequently expelled from Northern Rakhine in 2016 and 2017? I really do believe that it was that body drawn through the streets of Mogadishu that heralded the beginning of the end. After Somalia began, began a period more defined by reluctance and indifference in engaging and combating the scourge of war, there were some notable exceptions, Sri Lanka and Kosovo being among Sierra Leone and Kosovo being among the two most obvious. But the situation dramatically changed in, with 9-11. The launching of the war on terror invigorated the international community into action. But it wasn't action under UN leadership, but rather through coalitions of the willing, which instrumentalized the UN to justify their actions. There were a few such attempts, but the two which stand out are Iraq, of course, and then Libya. Libya, in Libya, France, with the support of the UK, managed to obtain a mandate to nominally address an impending humanitarian tragedy. But that ultimately led to Gaddafi being removed. A regime was changed and two of the five permanent members of the Security Council felt they had been duped. The subsequent impossibility of getting Security Council consensus on what to do in Syria was a direct result of Libya. And like the Rwandans, the Syrian people have paid the price. But what are the UN peacekeeping missions, you may well ask? Surely they are a demonstration of UN's ability to act and of the international community's resolve. The value of a UN peacekeeping force is its ability to create the conditions on the ground for the acceptance of political change. But are UN peacekeepers still able to achieve this? Most UN peacekeepers are not equipped to deal with the levels of violence that their missions entail. And troops and troop contributing countries are not willing to assume, assume the cost in terms of casualties. As already mentioned, when one of the permanent members of the Security Council is seriously concerned with the situation, a coalition is formed. The Security Council basically calls on UN peacekeepers in situations for which there is little real interest among the permanent five. And invariably, UN peacekeeping missions are tasked with an impossible West Westphalian mandate. The reestablishment of central government authority in fractured landscapes involves asserting the control of one group over others, which in turn naturally generates tension and violence that UN peacekeepers are not equipped to handle. Modern conflicts put in question the very notion of the nation state, but that is a completely different discussion. 
And what of the United Nations itself? Unfortunately, the story is not a good one. It is possibly best captured by the UN's repeated failures in two situations I got to know well, Sri Lanka and Myanmar. The UN failed in its protection mandate in both cases. But worse is the fact that significant parts of the UN continue to refuse to see the protection of victims as part of their mandate. The review of the UN's failure in Sri Lanka, which I led, was scathing. But rather than see the report as an attempt to draw attention to an institution in fundamental crisis, much of the UN senior management saw it as an unfair attack on an institution that could have done no better were it even to have tried. But isn't that the whole point? It didn't try. Fortunately, the Secretary General at the time, Ban Ki-moon, accepted the report and introduced a new policy that focused on the protection of civilians. But then less than 10 years later, the UN failed again in Myanmar. This time, the new Secretary General, Guterres, tasked the former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Guatemala to conduct the review. In this report, in his report, Gert Rosenthal acknowledged that his findings were actually nothing more than a reaffirmation of the findings in Sri Lanka. The UN as an institution had learned absolutely nothing. The toughest aspect of these two, two tales of failure is that whereas in Sri Lanka, the UN had a central role to play, in Myanmar, the UN's inaction was little, had little impact. By then, the UN had become irrelevant. Though it, through its repeated failures, the UN has demonstrated its structural inability to deal with complex crises. It has become glaringly obvious, it has also become glaringly obvious that the international community no longer really cares. Why should the UN United Nations even exist? The world today is not in a very good place, and we have been there before. One of the greatest concerns today has to be the perversion and apparent rejection of a rules-based international system. We are seeing the re-emergence of a particularly cynical, opportunistic form of bilateralism. We should never forget that the UN came out of the realization by an inspired group of world leaders who, having emerged from a second world conflagration, understood that unchecked nationalist self-interest could not guarantee long-term peace. The situation today should be of concern to all, and more particularly of great concern to smaller and middle-sized member states. How many here today can recall viewing the iconic image of Emperor Haile Selassie pleading at the League of Nations for support against Italy's invasion of his country? So today the UN, like its predecessor, the League of Nations, risks serving as little more than an illusion of international cooperation and commitment to principles. But, not, not, but unlike the 1930s, we're on, we are unlikely to be given a second chance to rebirth something like the United Nations. Climate change, the peacetime war footing of a number of our democracies, and now ep epidemics are global challenges that if inadequately confronted, will condemn the future of our societies and e even the existence of our planet. Is the United Nations still worth saving? Yes, but the organization needs to fundamentally refocus. The UN's unique role as the custodian of international norms and standards is essential. And there is good that is being done by some of its bodies and agencies to combat poverty, provide education, and fight diseases. But there is so much duplication of effort within the UN and too much pointless turf infighting between agencies. Both of these are distracting and destructive. The new Secretary General's reforms were a very good beginning, but they needed to go much further. For example, the merger of the Departments of Political Affairs and Peacekeeping, constituting major expenditures of the UN, that to be, appeared to be more cosmetic than substantive. This contrasts with the reform of the UN presence in countries, which is much more ambitious, but totally lacking in adequate financial support. But today, even if the reforms were fully implemented, they would probably not have gone far enough. The dramatic realignment of national budgets to deal with the economic shocks of combat combating the epidemic will starve the UN. The UN senior leadership needs to anticipate this dramatic shortfall in support. The last two appeals made by this UN Secretary General would demonstrate an inadequate appreciation of this reality. However strategic the appeals may have been in their analysis, 
they still still centered on UN entity, entities for the response, which is completely the wrong answer to the problem. To be effective, the UN has to reach out and forge, forge broader partnership. It can't be allowed to remain so focused on itself. The Secretary General's call for immediate ceasefires, on the, on the other hand, is exactly what the UN should be all about. The UN needs to understand its true added value and then refocus. Don't know if I have a few more minutes. Two more minutes. Okay, one minute. Well, actually, I'll stop here. And then uh, it was more to, to give some examples of what could be done. I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Charles. I mean, hugely fascinating from somebody who has really been in the middle of these very key questions. I want to remind participants that we are open now for any chat question or comment you might have for Charles Petrie. Charles, let me start um, by picking up on, on one thing that you said. Um, you were talking about cynical and opportunistic bilateralism, a very, you know, a sharp phrase. Uh, I think we all know what, what you're referring to there. But let me, let me um, ask you for a, a comment. Many of those countries who are, um, you know, using this kind of bilateralism these days are in fact the founders of the United Nations. And they sit on the, the permanent five uh, in the Security Council. And um, many people would say that um, you know, it is the permanent five countries who really control the agenda and who really control the activities of the United Nations system and, and its bodies. And therefore, rather than look to the UN system as, as the problem, maybe there needs to be something done at the level of the Security Council. Over to you. Yeah, I mean, one, I would say that many of the leaders today you know, who one could, uh, you know, who, who, who are promoting this bilateral approach are, are the representatives of the countries that founded the UN, because it's the leaders of those countries at the time that realized the need for a United Nations. It, it's an inspired group of world leaders that came together, having lived through basically two world wars, who, who, uh, uh, who, who reached the decision that, that some sort of platform needed to be put in place that would allow countries to, you know, to, to discuss, which was the, the, the Cold War. In terms of what you said, I totally agree. I, I mean, I, I think the, the, the problem of the Security Council is the configuration of the Permanent Five, and uh, which who were, I mean, representing the victors of the Second World War. So yes, the reform of the, 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 the Security Council is essential uh, in order to be able to, to re-give life to, uh, to the UN as a decision-making body, but it's not the only thing. I, I mean, I, I think the UN itself as an institution needs to refocus, needs to, to, to come back to what is its, its, uh, its founding legitimacy. And, and I mean, and it can do it. I mean, I, I, I think one of the big problems with the UN is actually the leadership and has been for, for a long time. And the leadership that anticipates problems, anticipates political problems. There's a great deal of, of sort of self-censorship at the top in terms of issues that need to be presented. The understanding being, well, it's not going to fly. The reason why I think the UN can reform is because there's still so many good people in the UN. And you'll be talking to one of them uh, next Thursday, Mark, Mark Cutts. There are, there are people within the UN who fundamentally believe in the principles of the UN and who are actually taking risks to promote them. And when they promote them on the ground, it actually has impact. It has huge impact. And so, so for me, the, uh, the institution needs to change and, and the leadership needs to understand the same thing that many of the people within the UN understand, which is the legitimacy of the UN comes from the UN Charter, not from an anticipation of the, the political games that they will have to confront. Thanks a lot for that, Charles. Um, we've got an unusually quiet group today, but that's good for me because I have lots of questions. Um, <laughs> can I just, I, I wanna pick up on what you said there right at the end of, of your last uh, response, Charles, which is, um, let's assume for a moment that some of the um, changes take place, that the UN becomes the thing um, that, that you have talked about. What changes then? What kind of difference is made? What could we expect 
from a quote unquote functional UN? I, I think, I mean, I, I think one is, is uh, its ability to play a convening role, that it would convene different actors. It would, have, it would have the legitimacy, it would have the weight to bring different actors to the table. So, so I think it's its role as, and, and, you know, as, as the ability to bring people together to try and come up with a collective response, or at the very least to ensure that the different responses are very much sort of, uh, um, I mean, that there is some sort of overall coherent approach. I think the second thing is, is uh, a UN that is focused, I mean, a UN that is refocused should be refocused on its real added value, which is norms and standards. So, so you would have a, a UN that not only is able to convene, but is also able to ensure that there is sort of uniformly an acceptance of what, what, uh, what are the minimum standards? You know, what are the, 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 the minimum rights that need to be uh, guaranteed? So, so I think it would be a, 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 um, a much more forceful voice empowered by principle, by principle and the rule of law. But, but and again, I, I think, you know, one of the problems right now is that the UN, the UN is shying away from taking that role, you know, and, and, uh, and it's, it's, there, there are too many, you know, too many politics, you know, the politics of being reelected, you know, the politics of, 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 of ensuring that, that sufficient representatives from different nations are present within the organization, rather than looking at uh, at competence and and at uh, a track record of belief in the system itself. Charles, when you um, talk about norms and standards right now, is it a stretch um, to suggest that our current situation with this COVID nineteen pandemic? Um, would be a case where a better functioning United Nations, um, uh, more clear and principled multilateralism would lead to a better global response? Well, I think in terms of the, the response, I, I, I would suggest that WHO is doing a very good job. I mean, they're, they're, they're definitely you know, trying to set the, 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 uh, the agenda in terms of what should be the response, what should be the approach. And, and I think they've been very, very consistent and very forceful in 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 getting their message out, uh, I, I think it's afterwards. It's 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 after the the you know, or, or it's it's the implications of the responses, the socioeconomic implications of the responses, and there also I think you know as as I, I said, I, I think the Secretary General's initial the 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 analysis contained within the appeals is is actually very very good. It brings out. The problem is that rather than then reaching out and, and using the UN as a, as a convener, so looking far beyond sort of the individual agencies in terms of the response, the, the, the response is one of, you know, Chris, you and I have been through this before. It's almost like a typical interagency appeal document where every UN agency has to explain what they're going to do when they're actually not the key players. I mean, the key, key players, of course, national governments, but the World Bank, the IMF, those are going to be the key players. And these are the people that should be embraced by whatever strategy the UN comes up with. Well, Charles, thank you so much for that and, and for joining us. I mean, it's a real privilege and a real pleasure to have you on. So thank you once again. Um, for all of those who are participating, a reminder that this Thursday at 12 o'clock Mountain Time, we will continue UN Week with Mark Cutts. He's the UN Deputy Regional Humanitarian Coordinator in the Syria crisis. He's worked on many of the world's biggest humanitarian emergencies over the last three decades, including Sudan, South Sudan, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Somalia, Iraq, Palestine, Jordan, Syria, Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, and Myanmar, if that's not enough for you. Amazing. Uh, and Charles did mention Mark as somebody who's a very senior uh, and very important UN leader who, who has the reputation. Uh, of leading by principle. So Mark will join us. Mark will join us on Thursday. I hope you all will as well. Until then, thank you all very much. Have a good week. Bye, Chris. Thanks. Bye-bye.